we have Bill Whitliff tonight as our guest as part of the JC Water. We are broadcasting live on Facebook Live, and uh, we're all Is it going in and out? Is that better? How about now? Is it working? So thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm going to do a little introduction about uh, Bill. I don't want to spend too much time on his bio because I'm really much more interested in the stories, but we do have to set the setting about some of the things you've done. So he's a native Texan. Uh, he grew up in Texas. He had his high school years in Blanco, just west of Austin. He went to, he graduated from the University of Texas, where he met his wife Sally. I know many of you know Sally, and he, she's here tonight. Um, <laughs> yay, Sally! <laughs> Texas Monthly writer Skip Hollingsworth calls Bill the talented Mr. Whistler, and indeed he is exceptionally talented. He's probably best known as a screenwriter, but he's also a novelist, photographer, director, producer, publisher. He's a member of CAST, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, he's also a member of the Academy of Motion Picture and Sciences. He's an archivist, both uh, literary and photography, husband, father, and um, at 29 he was uh, he joined the Texas Institute of Letters. He is, I guess, best known probably for his many screenplays, and I'm just going to read you the list of them. And it took a while to compile them because they're not in one place. Your, your Wikipedia page needs work. <laughs> <laughs> it would take a, somebody a long time to add all the things that you've done. So, so this, these are screenplays. So Black Stallion, Raggedy Man, Barbarossa, Honeysuckle Rose, Country, Lonesome Dove, Legends of the Fall, The Perfect Storm, and The Red-Headed Stranger. So, to those screenplays and teleplays. He's also written two novels, recently two novels, and published several books of photography. One, I'm sure many of you have seen The Lonesome Dove, one which I have had in my collection. So, you, yeah. so I have my own Whitliffe collection. <laughs> Get one up. And of course, he and his uh, wife Sally have our co-founders of the Whitliffe collections in, at Texas State, which we'll talk about a little later. So I want to start kind of at the beginning, not too, too far back, but let's start after you graduated from college, and you and Sally got married, you two decide that you're going to start Encino Press. So tell us a little bit about those years, and I'm particularly interested to know where that seed money for that uh, business came from. You must know, or you wouldn't have answered the question. <laughs> um, you know, Sally and I were just kids. We had a passion for books. Um, we weren't desperate to do any particular thing. Um, we decided we wanted to publish books in addition to, you know, our regular job. Sally was teaching math in the Dallas school system. And I was working for the SMU Press. And, um, boy, to tell one story, I almost have to tell some others. There's one I do want to when, when we were in college, um, Sally knew that, that I had a, a great fondness for J. Frank Dobie and his writing. I mean, he was, uh, he was my hero. And when we were at the university, and it was about a two weeks before my birthday, Sally went over and, and got Dobie to sign a book for me on my birthday. I didn't even know Dobie lived in Austin. But, and then she said, well, you, you ought to go over and, and meet him. He's really a nice man. 
But I was so awestruck by him, I didn't have the courage to do that until maybe three months later. And finally I did call him and uh, asked if I could come over and, and get him to sign a book. And he said, yeah, I'll come over. But he said, come a little bit after four. He said, because I always take a little siesta. <laughs> His house was on Water Creek right across the street from the law school, uh, or what is now the law school. Anyway, I went over there and I knocked on the door and nobody answered. And I knocked on the door and nobody answered. And I walked around in the backyard and Dobie was back there in a pair of cut off khakis <laughs> with a little glass of Jack Daniels on, the, yeah. on his uh, yard furniture taking a shower bath. <laughs> so I introduced myself and, uh, and Dobie was wonderful, you know, he, he was wonderful, <laughs> white hair and, and uh, he, his voice sounded like water running over gravel, he was, <laughs> and he said, well, come on in the house. So we walked toward the house, there were steps that went up to a landing, and then from the landing, he went in the house. And as he got to the top of the steps, he turned and looked down at me. I was still reaching for the first step. And he said, are you out at the university? And I said, yes, sir, I'm in the School of Journalism. And he, he, his eyes just sort of flashed. And he said, God damn you, boy. He said, why don't you take something that'll put fiber in your mind? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I had no answer whatever. <laughs> But anyway, I went in, uh, I was in absolute awe of him. He was very friendly to me. Um, I think he thought I was okay, because over the next few years before he died, I mean, I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth over to Dobie's to visit and so on. And every time I went, he would give me books. One time he gave me two big grocery sacks full of things he had written. They were published articles or the manuscripts or it was just incredible. All this stuff now is at Texas State in that collection. That was really what started that collection. So it was Dobie just kind of passing through me on to the future. Uh, but that lit the fire in me. Uh, and Sally, I guess, threw me uh, to try to do something with books in Texas. You know, the stories of Texas and people of Texas and the culture of Texas and so on. So that's where the idea came to publish books. And when we decided to do it, I wrote W a letter. We were in Dallas. I wrote W a letter and there was an essay he had written called Bob Moore, Man in Birdman was about a rancher who had a fondness for birds and bird eggs and he became uh, one of the world's leading authorities on bird nests and bird eggs, though he was just no captain. And uh, W had written this wonderful essay on it. So I wrote W and said, you know, we wanted to start a little publishing company and uh, would he permit me to make a book out of that? And he wrote back and he said, no, he said, it's, uh, I've already got a publisher. He said, it's, it's possible for a writer to scatter his, his brand too much. And he said, so I don't think so. So I didn't write back. But um, a couple of weeks later, I got a letter from him. And he said, I've been rethinking your proposal to publish that in a little book. And he said, it's all right. He said, go ahead. He said, I want to write an introduction to it. Um, in other words, then he was just wildly enthusiastic. And that was one month to the day before he died. Oh. And, uh, but, but he had huge, huge influence on Sally and me and, and on the Encino and what we have done. And I mean, one story leads to another, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to put me back on the track. But uh, years later, after Dobie died, everything was left to Bertha, his widow, including his archives, those that were still in the house. The rest of them had been sold to the University of Texas, and they were in the archives at the University of Texas. But anyway, 
Toby died, everything was left to Bertha. Bertha died, everything was left to Edgar Kinte, who was her nephew, and who was the great bird man of Texas. And then when Edgar died, everything was left to Willie Bell Coker, who had been Doby's private sec personal secretary, a wonderful lady, and she had become a friend of mine because it was always through her that I would get hold of Doby and say, can I come for a visit? Uh, anyway, when Edgar died, then by Doby's will, all of his papers, all of his writing archives that were left, then were left to Willie Bell. And one day Willie Bell called me and she said, um, do you want Dr. She called him Dr. D. She said, do you want Dr. D's desk? And it was a wonderful desk made out of mesquite from the rafters of the Bee County Courthouse where Doby was right. And I said, yeah, I'd love it. And she said, well, I can't keep all this stuff. I'm going to have a, a, a state sale and that's going to be for sale. And uh, she said, but if you want to come over before the sale, you know, and look at it, absolutely. So the next day I went over and I was sitting and said how much. She had an agent there. And she told me and I was writing a check for that amount at Doby's desk. And I looked over and there were about 30 or 40 boxes, cardboard boxes, stacked up in the corner. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, that's what's left of Dr. D's archives. And I said, well, I thought those would have gone to the university. And she said, no, they're here. And, um, you know, they didn't send anybody to look, look at them. And, uh, and I said, well, uh, how much? So she and her agent went in the other room to talk about the price. And I went over and just stuck my hand in the top box and it was correspondence with people and diaries and articles and manuscripts. It was just unbelievable. 30, 40 boxes of this stuff. So they came back out and uh, said it's this much. So I called Sally and said, you know, if I write a check for this amount, will it cash? <laughs> And Sally said, what are you doing? <laughs> but anyway, so I did write a check, and, and we did buy it. And then um, I was driving a pickup at that time. It started raining. I went to the Utah and got, I don't know, 40, 50 of those giant black trash bags <laughs> and put a box in each one, loaded, loaded them on the back of the pickup and drove back to my office and then Connie Todd was then my assistant and over the next several weeks I mean Connie and I just poured through that stuff and it was just remarkable and amazing. Though the very first article Doby ever wrote that got published I mean it had the manuscript and just great treasures and stuff. So Sally and I at that point decided it was too much for us to have that it should be out there in the culture. So we started talking to various um, universities and collections about doing a Southwestern Writers Collection and that the Doby stuff would be the hub. And then from, from the hub you could go anybody else, like Harrigan for example. <laughs> you know, we have all this stuff. Um, so that's, that's what started the collection that's now at Texas State. But it was also a, just an enormous inspiration to me um, to stay with our culture, the Texas culture, the whole thing. Um, I talked to various universities. I finally talked to Texas State. My, my year, my first year in college, I went to five schools. <laughs> and had a good time at all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I went to Texas State and I, I called the librarian and said, you know, we had all this Doby stuff and, and our idea was to start a Southwestern Writers Collection and the Doby stuff would be the hub. Uh, pretty much every university we talked to wanted to do it. Then I went to Texas State, was talking to the librarian and they said, well, you need to talk to the president. 
and that was Bob Hardesty. Hardesty, a, a terrifically nice guy, wasn't really a librarian. He was a speechwriter for LBJ, and then became president of Texas State. But anyway, um, went to talk to him, and uh, he was sitting at his at his table in his office. And he, he was smoking a cigarette, reading the paper, and had his feet propped up on the table. And he said, what is it you want to do? And I said, well, I want to start a, a really grand, world-class collection of Southwestern literature. And he said, well, we already have that, don't we? And I said, no, sir, you don't. <laughs> he said, but you think you should have it? And I said, I, I do think you should, should have it. And he sat there just about this long and he said, let's do it. <laughs> and I said, okay. And he said, but, I said, I've, I've got a couple of requirements. He said, of course you do. And I said, I want Sally and I to have a say on who the curator is. And he said, of course you do. He said, you don't want somebody's cousin from Biloxi to come in. <laughs> We want to work with the architect on the space. And he said, fine, that's fine. And I mean, it was literally that quick. And we had a mama and daddy for the collection and a home. And it, it was the best thing that could ever have happened because Hardesty was wonderful. He wasn't there much longer, but he was wonderful for that time. Then Jerry Supple came and he was fabulous. And then now Denise Trout. And she's just a wonder on earth. So it's been blessed from the very beginning. And I started calling my writer friends, Steve Harrigan, John Graves, Sam Shepard, just Bud Strait, Gary Cartwright, just my pals, and said what I'll do. And here they came with all their stuff. Um, I called Sam, I think he was living in. Santa Fe at that time, and uh, I said, what are we doing? And Sam's original stuff, manuscripts and some were in two places. Um, they were at the University of Virginia and at Boston University. Nobody else had any original stuff. But anyway, I looked out the window one day, and here came this pickup, pulled up in front of my office, and it was Sam and a pickup, and the pickup was just full of cardboard boxes, which turned out to be, you know, fabulous literary archive of Sam Shepard, who is the most produced American playwright we've ever had, or we have now. But it was like it was, you know, it was one of these things where you just if you just announce it here, they come, and it was unbelievable. Everybody thought it was a good idea. Everybody wanted to participate. Not just to have their stuff in it, but you know, um, it was great. And then later, yeah. And then tell us later, ten years later. So you you donated your collection of photography. Is that correct? Uh, so yeah, that one, that's yeah. right. Ten years. So we did the we did the writers' collection first, and then ten years later, uh, I called Jerry Supple and said, "Why don't we also start a photography collection?" <coughs> Texas, the Southwest, and Mexico. And he said, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and Sammy and I had a hand, we had my stuff, of course, but we also had a handful of, you know, like a few Bravo pieces and a few of this, a little of that and so, but not, not a huge, brilliant collection, but a beginning. And, uh, and then, what well, within a short time, we had Keith Carter. There's a wonderful photographer from Dripping Springs named Rocky Schink. And I had, I had known his work, but I'd never met Rocky and I didn't know anything about him. And I opened a photography magazine with a big article about him and showing his work. And it said, Rocky Schink from Dripping Springs, Texas. I said, God Almighty, Dripping Springs. So, and that he's living in California. So I dialed information and got, and got a lovely operator and I said, 
remember where this guy lives, what's his sheet, S-E-A-G-N-C-K, but I need to get hold of him. And she said, well, let's find him. <laughs> and, that's fine. I mean, and, and she got, she got however she got, wherever she got, but she found him. And um, so I called him, and he answered the phone. And he said, this is Rocky Sheik. And I said, well, this is Bill Whitliff. I said, you don't know me. But I said, in 19, I'm, I said, you don't know me, but I'm originally from Blanca. And in 1957, we just whooped the hell out of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I didn't miss a beat. He said, well, he said, you didn't whoop me. He said, because they wouldn't let me play. <laughs> started the writer's collection, but now we really try to do the same thing for photography. <clears throat> and, uh, and that I loved his stuff, and and I wanted to buy a bunch of it, but I was a cheapskate. <laughs> and he said, how cheap? <laughs> and I told him. And he said, well, God damn. <laughs> but we started buying Rocky stuff. We had published two books by Rocky. I did the same thing with Keith Carter who is just an astonishingly wonderful American photographer, you know, who lives in Beaumont. And we've got, called now over 2,000 pictures of, from Keith. But it was like that, up and down the lane. Uh, Russell Lee, we have 500 and some odd pictures by Russell Lee, and he's one of America's great FSA photographers. But it's just like, it's just, you know, and the great Mexican photographers, Bravo and Graciela, and just up and down the line. So it's from the very beginning, those collections have been blessed, and they're still being blessed, and everything else comes out of those. Thank you so much. That was that was a short, short word. Yeah, <laughs> I, had, I had all those questions on my list. So I, so we've gone from publishing and we've talked about the Whitliff collections. Now the both pieces now are called the Whitliff collections. And I um, so I want to talk about the the time. You know, a lot of people may dream of doing something or maybe think they can do something, but you weren't necessarily one of those kids who wrote like, you know, as a child or wrote in college and from what I have read, but it, it came to you, and I want you to tell us a story about what gave you kind of the impetus that you could write. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> uh, it really, I mean, I always wanted to tell stories. It wasn't so much that I wanted to write, it's that I wanted to tell stories. Because I was raised in little Texas towns at a time when the heroes were cowboys or storytellers. And, you know, in the evenings, just about the time the fireflies started blinking, people would be out on their porch or out in their yard telling stories. And um, we lived in Edna, Texas. My mother ran the telephone office there. And there was a wonderful man uh, named Westoff who ran the local hardware and he was really nice to me and I would go in there and he'd give me nails and a hammer and boards to make stuff. I was even six years old or whatever. And there were five years old. Um, and another man down the street named Callaway and he was a great storyteller. But I mean neighbors would come from all over the place to sit and listen to stories. And I was just transfixed and and to see how people responded to a good story was 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 a, really something for me. Now at that time uh, my mother and father were divorced. My father was a terrible drunk and mother left him because she was afraid that he would pull my brother and me and her down with him. So she left. She had no education, nobody helped her, no money, no nothing. But she got a job with the telephone company. I, I wrote a movie about this called Raggedy Man with Sister Space. Oh, yeah. A lot of that is my mom's life. Um, but in small towns like that, 
there was a real stigma uh, to a woman who was divorced. Nobody ever thought it was the man's fault. The woman took it, you know, took the blame. And, uh, and you kind of, as a kid, you know, you felt a certain distance from the heart of the town because your mother was, there was a certain stick. Simple as that. And, uh, and I wanted, as any kid, wanted very badly to belong. And I saw that the guys who really belonged were either cowboys or storytellers. So early on, I wanted to tell stories. And, uh, and that just kind of slid over into the writing <laughs> later on. But that was, that was the deal. And what was your first screenplay? Oh, uh, my first screenplay was Barbarossa. Right. And it took you about, I've read, 30 days to write. You just sat down and... Wrote. Actually, what happened, I was working on a book, A Visual History of Dallas, that A.C. Green wrote, the text for it. And um, I was chasing a, hand, a collection of old turn-of-the-century glass plate negatives. And um, so I would drive to Dallas and try to deal with that guy and then drive back and then drive us home. Anyway, but every time I got in the car, I would start thinking about this story my grandfather told me. And I started building on it. And then um, at the end of 30 days, I had the glass plate negatives and I had seen the whole story. Because I was driving, I wasn't writing, I was just seeing it. So then I sat down and wrote it and because I had seen it, I wrote it as a screenplay, though I had never seen a screenplay. Hmm. The next morning, I mean, I just barely finished, and I had it on my desk, and Bud Schreck came in. Oh. And uh, Bud had written Kid Blue, which was a movie, he got made with Dennis Hopper, and so on. Anyway, Bud said, you're writing movies. And I said, well, I'm peddling around. He said, well, let me read this. So he took it home, and the next morning he called me and said, this damn thing will sell. And I said, how? And he said, let me send it to Cindy. Cindy Degner was his agent and Dan Jenkins' agent and Larry King's agent and so on. And she was the wife of Sterling Lord, who was one of the top literary agents in New York at the time. So Bud sent it to Cindy and said, you know, she'll, she could do something with it. A couple of days later, I got this long letter from Cindy Degner and she absolutely hated it. <laughs> just couldn't stop bitching at me in this letter. Right? I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I should have done this and I should have, nobody will understand this. And, uh, and I was a little arrogant, ignorant and arrogant. And I wrote her letter back and said I appreciated her letter but I wasn't looking for a critic. I was looking for a salesman. So she wrote back and she said that she had two friends, Barry Weiss and Phil Van Tunk. They were the producers of the French Connection. And she said they've just finished another movie, which was a sequel to the French Connection called The Seven Ups. And she said they're traveling around the country uh, promoting that movie. And she said, I'm going to send it to them if you don't marry me, and see what they say. And I said, okay. So she sent it to them. They loved it. <laughs> uh, they had a deal with CBS to do a television series. So they, and so they called me and they said, um, you know, we will buy this and we'll use it as the series. We already have a deal to make with CBS, but you have to move to LA. And I said, well, I won't do that. Anyway, so then we ended the call. Then a couple of nights later they called and said, yeah, but you know, we'll do this. You just move to LA and said, that's not what we do. And we, it went like that for two weeks, like sometimes every night, sometimes every other night or whatever. We said, all you've got to do is move to L.A. And, and we'll make this. And I kept saying no. And, uh, and then one day they never called back. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that's the show business. Uh, but it, I, I have a certain amount of confidence in it that maybe I could do that. And um, so I wrote another one, and it got optioned. Um, I think I wrote one more, and it got optioned. And then I, I got a call 
from somebody and they said, um, United Artists wants to talk to you about doing the Black Stadium. And so I said, okay. So they flew me to LA. Um, it was a, a Coppola deal with through that studio. And uh, Tom Sternberg, who was uh, one of the producers of Apocalypse Now and other stuff, met me at the airport. We had lunch. We had dinner. Uh, he took me out to Anselmo um, to meet the director of the Black Stadium. And I'm losing track of what all that, so much happened that way. Anyway, the next morning I went out there to talk to him. That was the morning that um, they, they brought the first cut of the first Star Wars to San Anselmo, which is where, what's this being directed it? Star Wars. Lucas. Lucas. That was Lucas Studio. So, uh, 20th Century Fox, which was the studio doing it, brought three busloads of people to see the first cut of Star Wars when I was there. I didn't see it, but I, you know, walked down the hall and some kid, I mean, God, God, you thought he was in kindergarten, and he would open a door and he'd say, Psst, come look at this, come here, come look at this. <laughs> and you'd go and he would open the door and there would be Darth Vader, you know, on a, a, a stand, with, you know, the outfit. And, and he said, isn't that neat? So isn't that neat, neat, neat? And I said, boy, that is really neat. And I was walking out. And then there's some kid would look out of the next door. He said, hey, come here, come here. Look at this. Open the door, go in, and there would be the death ship. You know, as big as three of these tables. You know, perfect in every way. And he would say, isn't that neat? <laughs> he said, isn't that neat, neat, neat? But anyway. <laughs> so they showed the first cut of, of the first Star Wars that day, and the 20th century people walked out of there just horror struck. They thought all they had was a Saturday matinee movie. Oh. Uh, they were scared and petrified and disappointed and so on. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> Carol Ballard was going to be the director of, of the Black Stadium. He was a guy who had been out there for a long time um, and had scar tissue all over him from just being in Hollywood. <laughs> but he was a good guy. And uh, so we got along the fan and so they said, well, would you do this? And I said, yeah, I won't go through all that, but what worked out there? Well, that's not the only time you said no to Hollywood. You've said no a couple of times. You were set to direct country, and they fired your cinematographer. Isn't that right? Oh, you know that. <laughs> and then also, Red, tell us the story about Redheaded Stranger. You, uh, it had been optioned to Universal Studios, yeah. and um, they wanted to star Robert Redford. Is that right? <laughs> and you ended up find script back. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, it was a willy deal, you know, which is to say there's no rhyme or reason to anything. It just, you know, walk around in willy world. Good things happen, bad things happen, certainly funny things happen, memorable things happen, and so on. But Redheaded Stranger was based on Willie's album, Redheaded Stranger. And uh, you, so they hired me to write the script. They then sent it to Redford. Redford said he wanted to do it. Now, at that time, Redford was the hottest male star in the world. And Redford, a lot of times, would say, yeah, I'll do it. But then he never would say when. And so, but what that did was just, it froze many scripts. I mean, it just froze it because you couldn't do anything else with them as long as Redford said he would do it because it was worth so much money to the studios and so on. Um, 
But finally, basically what happened is we, we got tired of waiting for Redford to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. you know, and I had a friend at Universal Studios named Tom Mount and uh, who had some power there. And uh, anyway, so bought it out of that and then later we made a small independent film out of it, which was just enormous fun. Well, how did you, you know, it's so interesting to me how you, you your career progressed. How did you know you could direct? <laughs> well, to, to some degree I found out I could. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very different thing. I mean, it's, it's especially different uh, when you've got big stars because you know, I mean, a big star will come over and say, well, I'd never say that. And you say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you would say or what you wouldn't say. That's what the character says. And they say, but I never say it. And I'm the one playing the part. And uh, <laughs> this isn't occasional. I mean, this is, it is a all of the time. <laughs> but it's just, I mean, it's what it is. And nobody has to do it. Uh, and I, I mean, I learned there were some things I could do, but there were also some things I just didn't have the temper to tolerate. I mean, you know, but, uh, but I, God knows I'm hugely lucky in all of this. I mean, you know, they had some real talent like my movies, you know, like Willie, like Sissy, like Sam. I mean, you know, these, these are great people to work with. Um, okay, well, let's move on to Lonesome Dove. So you had a whole series in the 80s that of, of screenplays that you wrote. We've talked about that. And so tell us how it came to be that you were chosen to write, I guess it's called a teleplay for Lonesome Dove. I mean, I know you already had a working relationship with um, Larry McMurtry because you had published some of his... We published his uh, um, third book, I think it was. Yeah. And so you were also the co-producer on this, you know, hugely popular, it's one of the most popular miniseries ever to be produced. There are 26 million people watched it and won, won seven Emmys. And many critics, and probably a lot of people in this room, might think this one of the best Western films ever. <laughs> so tell us, do they just call you up and say, hey, Bill? Kind of. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I made Barbarossa, which was a Western, which had a little difference in song. Um, but Suzanne DePass was president of Motown Pictures. And Swifty Lazar, you've heard of Swifty yeah, Lazar, yeah. the notorious, tricky agent. <laughs> uh, but Swifty um, told Suzanne that she was the first one to get a shot at Lums of Dove, the film lines. When in fact, everybody had turned it down. <laughs> I mean, everybody had turned it down because at that time, the only thing better than westerns were miniseries. <laughs> and this was the size and so on. It was obviously going to be a miniseries. But Suzanne was smart enough to see the possibilities in it. So she optioned it for Motown. Then she called me and said, you know, I just optioned McMurtry's uh, Lungs and Dove. You know, would you, uh, would you consider writing screenplays? Absolutely. So, whereas my agent told her, no, Bill doesn't do television. <laughs> <laughs> this is Hollywood, you know. <laughs> um, so I flew, no, wait, this was still on the phone. So, so I said, Yep, I, I would love to write the screenplay. And she said, and would you produce it with me? And I said, I'd love to produce it with you. But if I produce it with you, I want mutual creative control. And she said, that's fine. So, okay. But then CBS said, absolutely not. No writers is going to have mutual creative control on that. 
you know. And so it went back and forth, back and forth. And I kept saying, no, I don't want to do it if I don't have mutual creative control. And finally, this went on for weeks and weeks. And finally, the head of business affairs at CBS called me. And he said, as they do, with this great familiarity, Bill. And I said, yeah. He said, you've been in the business a long time. He said, you know that CBS is not going to give any writer mutual creative control. And I said, I do know that. And he said, well, then you'll do it. And I said, no, I won't do it. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And finally he said, why are you being so hard-headed? He said, you know this, I mean, you know no studio, no network is going to give a writer mutual creative control. And I said, I do know that. He said, why are you being so hard? I said, I can tell you. I said, number one, I said, Lonesome Dove in Texas is like a Bible. And I said, people love the book, and I love the book. And, uh, and I said, the author is a Texas treasure and a good friend of mine. And I said, if I write the screenplay, he's, I said, it's, it's going to certainly take me a year. And I said, and I, I would almost bet everything I've got that at the end of that year, when I turn it in, it's going to be pretty good. And I said, but I don't want to go through all of that and then have you guys come behind me and cast Dom DeLuise and Jim Hager. <laughs> CBS caved in, and <laughs> Suzanne and I and CBS, we all three shared creative control, and so basically nobody could force anything, you know, and uh, but it, it, it got to be real battles. They did not want Tommy Lee. Oh. <laughs> they, they, they did not want Robert Duvall. Oh. They wanted they wanted guys who were suntanned on both sides. <laughs> what they wanted to do was they wanted to cast the marquee. Yeah. So you could get butts and chairs in front of television sets. Whereas our thought was, let's make the best ones on that we can, and that'll take care of everything else. Y'all need, I need, and so on. And, uh, but boy, it got, it, it, got, it got really crazy, you know, the casting. So, and those were, you know, we battled for months about casting. Well, I was going to ask you about that because I, you know, it was such a beloved book. And not only was the book, the story treasured, but the characters. And part of what makes Lonesome Dove as a film work is because of the actors in, the, in there. And I was wondering if you had a hand in that. And, that, and oh, yeah. thank you for, yeah, because it wouldn't have worked otherwise. Well, I don't think, or wouldn't have worked as well. Both Tommy Lee and, and Duval were friends. Uh, Duval is one of our greatest actors in the history of film, Absolutely. but he's never been a movie star. He's a great actor, but he's not a he's not a movie star. He's just not. Tommy Lee is Tommy Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, you know, you talk about a strong wind blowing. <laughs> They were perfect for the part. What, yeah. what astonished people was that Duval was Gus. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. most people thought, well, he should be yeah. called. Yeah. You know, but in fact, his agent called me and said he can't be Gus. And I said, he's one of the greatest actors in the world, and he's your client. And you said he can't, he can't be Gus. Oh, I can't be Gus. I never told Duval that story. <laughs> Please don't you tell. either. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you know, Duvall's a great actor, and he worshipped that part. Tommy Lee liked that part, too. But, you know, Tommy Lee just fit hand glove the call characters. But so did other people, like Tim Scott playing P.I. Oh, my God. You know, Tim's just wonderful. Everybody was. I think we missed a couple of places. Um, 
Freddie was not the best blue duck we could have found. I don't think. But, um, <coughs> and he was, he was minus a couple of books to make a library. <laughs> So you would be on the set. How long did it take to film that? And then you just did you do did you set out intentionally knowing you were going to make a book, or you were just curious and wanted to see what kind of pictures? No, you I wanted. I knew this was oh. special. And when we gathered that cast, and when we found our locations, you know, down on the Rio Grande and then in New Mexico, and Texas, this is going to be a visual um, tour de force. You know, just mm -hmm. what you, what the movie looks like. And uh, so I just decided I wanted to photograph it, and I was on set every day, mm -hmm. and uh, and stole it. So I started photographing, and I, I'm sure I had a thought in my head that you know um, I could do something else with those pictures. So out of these parts, and then we'll move on. I mean, um, you know, what part, you know, the writing, the directing, the producing, which part just, you know, delights you? Which part do you get super happy about when you're, like, when are you in the zone? Um, I don't know how to answer that because it's really all the same thing. And, you know, when you're writing, you know, you're the first guy to hear the actors doing the dialogue. You're the, you're the first guy that sees what the costumes, you know. Because you, if it's, it's your, going good, it's in your head. Because yeah, it's just, it. and Larry is such a visual writer that you know, reading Larry's book, I'm sure everybody, you know, had their own image of Gus and Colin and Pi and Deets and you know, and the Hellbitch and all of those things, <laughs> um, you know, and that's what made that a great book because you know you don't you're not back here with that book, you're a participant. You're right in there with Larry's characters and his story and our history because a lot of that, a lot of Larry's book is Texas history, mm -hmm. you know, authentic Texas history. You know, it's us. We we all know that. And if it's not us, it's we want to we want to believe it's us. We, we want that to be us. You know, we want Gus to be our granddaddy or our, or our aunt, Tommy Lee too. I mean, we just do. You know. And that's Larry's great genius with this. We could talk and talk, and I do want to talk about a couple of things, and and then I'm going to open it up to questions because I know everyone has questions, and I get to share the mic a little bit. But I, until I started doing this research, I really did not understand your connection with J. Frank Doby, and it explains a lot about to me about you. And one of the things that Bill has done is he's a member of CAST, which is the Capital Area Statues. And their first uh, work is a, a piece called Philosopher's Rock. And I was wondering if you would tell us about Philosopher's Rock and how that came about. Um, well, Larry Wright's the one that came up with that. And then Larry called Steve and me. And anyway, and it just, you know. So all of a sudden we had seven writers, essentially. Um, and, and so we said, yeah, let's, you know, let's do a monument to those guys. W be better checking well. And, um, and of course, we, it's like all this. Like, ignorance is bliss. We, we didn't have any money. We had an idea. Uh, we had an enthusiasm for that idea, passion, really. And um, so we started looking around and talking around for sculptors. And uh, we sent out, um, I guess you'd almost have to call it a playbill, you know, to sculptors. And, uh, and they responded, not all of them, but some of them with little maquettes. You know, some of them were absolutely terrible. <laughs> uh, but the one Glenn Goodacre, sent in was actually cast in bronze it had the absolute likeness of all three guys uh, from photographs and I mean you just went well you know how did I mean it was like if we had been able to sculpt that's what we would have done and so we made a deal with her 
and uh, made a deal with the parks so that we could put it in Zilker Park and so on. In case any of you have not seen it, it's at Zilker Park. <coughs> and the kids climb all over it. Oh. It's the, it and your friend uh, Keith Carter talks about how you have a need to tell and preserve. And to me, that you all have preserved in that statue the relationship that those men had the friendship the camaraderie yeah. and the delight they had in each other's company yeah. it comes through so distinctly yeah. in that sculpture and they inspired each other i mean you know they were all part of the other guy's life and work i mean you know, they read each other's work before it was published it's kind of like it's going on now with our bunch you know we did yeah. that i mean because Everybody. And when Bill's talking about his bunch, he has a bunch that they, like Steve Harrigan and Larry Wright, and that Larry, you guys hang out together. Brooke. Yeah. It's uh, a tribe of, of yeah. writers. Yeah. <clears throat> Looking for inspiration. <laughs> Let's Looking move on to these, these, <laughs> these books. Okay, so I, you know, I, the, you know, we started out this as a, um, mostly writers of novels and, you know, Sally Whitliffe goes, oh, you know, well, Bill's written a new novel. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, I, I, I order it. And, you know, look at this gorgeous thing shows up. And, and, and I, I just, I, when it shows up, I just think, of course, it's this artistic and this interesting. So Bill has also written these two wonderful novels. Um, and, of course, they are written in a style that is very unique and, and fun to read. And so these are your latest work. Tell us what you're working on. I mean, this is the latest I know of. Tell us what you're well, working there, on now. These are the first two volumes of a trilogy. Okay. And the, the Devil's Backbone and the Devil's Sinkhole, and the one I'm about to finish now, is called The Devil's Fork, which is a, a decision. You know, decide to do this or fork over here, which is not good. Not good for my character. <laughs> um, but it's, I mean, there, I, I, I stole a lot of things from my grandfather, little bits and pieces, and then built on them, and things from my mother. Um, you know, and writers do that, you know, we, we just steal all, we steal wherever we can get it, <laughs> if we can make use of it. And uh, so these are just stories. I made a deal with myself when I started that I wasn't going to try to figure them out, um, you know, and plot them out. I was just going to put pen to paper and and follow follow the story as it developed. So that I was traveling with the story. I wasn't ahead of it. I wasn't behind it. I was right with it. And um, I never would have tried that when I was young because I wanted to be somebody. You know? yeah. but, but now, you know, what, what are y'all going to do to me? <laughs> That's exactly what Sarah Bird said. She said, what, what is anybody going to do to yeah, me? Yeah, what can they do to me? They had their chance. <laughs> All right, so you're working on the third one. What else are you working on? Like, what collection are you putting together? And you're, you, you've been known to be a very hard worker. Lots well, of things going on. Are you still at that pace? The, the big exciting thing at the collection, you know, we have a writer's collection. We have a photography collection. And we are just cranking up to do a music collection. And, uh, and that's all of our guys. We, we got Jerry Jeff's archives. Uh, everything. Pictures, recording. Shirts, hats, boots, you know. Anyway, and we're, I, I'm afraid to mention some of the stuff we're doing in there because it's such a good idea. You know, somebody <laughs> might come in <laughs> you know, tomorrow morning and uh, do it before we do. But that's the next big thing at the collection is, you know, in Texas, if you've never been to the collection, I mean, not just because Sally and I have started it, it is a wonderful, wonderful bunch of stuff from our culture. Uh, you know, John Graves' paddle, you know, that he used when he floated down the Brazos and then rode goodbye to a river. Uh, J. Frank W.'s white, white suit, uh, 
and his shoes that were made in England because a horse stepped on one of his foot, and so his shoe was bent like that. You know, no regular shoe would fit on his foot. Um, we have um, a couple of joints that, that Willie. <laughs> I want something to represent women. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, of course, we have a world of Willie stuff, you know, a bunch of stuff. Um, we've got Russell Lee's first camp, first two campus. Wow. Um, God, I'm mean, just Indians, Billy. Indians. Indians. Yes, Say it, sir. Your whole collection you just bought. This is your new gallery. We just got it. We've been this way about uh, <laughs> We just got, after looking for three years, we just bought the whole, or found a collection, of Edward Curtis. Indian, over 2,000 of them. Uh, we, can, we can have three or four shows a year for 30 years and never show the same print twice. And um, they, they are just magic and just wonderful. And they're, in fact, Texas State is building a whole gallery that's going to be a permanent Edward Curtis Indian gallery. Um, I mean, and it won't show anything but Curtis. And you know, we're looking for some ephemeral things. The pepper it up a, a bit. Are those from the original books, Bill? Yeah, they are the originals. There are 20 volumes of books. So 20 two, volumes, yeah. And 20 volumes of the portfolio. 20 <coughs> over here. Uh, okay, and okay. this is an event, April 7th. Oh. 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 There's an event, April 7th. Here's the event, April 2nd, Sunday, from 2 to 4 in the afternoon, uh, and, and there will be a conversation about the Edward Curtis and the review of the exhibit. There'll be a show over there on new acquisitions, so it's not, it is the Curtis. But it is the Curtis. It is the Curtis, but also the hot stuff we've been able to get in the last uh, year. So, do you get those from the estates? <laughs> You have to, for Curtis, you look all over the world, and and, uh, and oddly enough, let me tell you one other quick story. The first book in history in the world to mention Texas is the narrative of Cabeza de Vaca, which is there are fewer than there are twenty or less in the world. Um, UT has one. Um, well. And I said to Connie, when we were just starting to build a collection, I said, we'll know that we're really cranking with this collection when we have the narrative of Cabeza de Vaca. And it wasn't 10 days after that. And I got a call from Dorothy Sloan, who's a book dealer in Austin. And she said, I'm just back from Chicago. She said, guess what I've got? She said, a narrative of Cabeza de Vaca. <laughs> And I said, you're kidding. And she said, no. And I said, how much? And she told me. Anyway, so we got it. And, you know, it's in the collection. Uh, scholars from all over the world come to look at it. Terrific. Now, the Indian stuff, the Curtis, we looked for three years. I mean, calling dealers, calling families that had them calling libraries to see if they wanted to be accession, what they had and so We finally found them. Guess where we found them? University of Texas. Oh. <laughs> they had three copies. <coughs> they didn't need three. They had sold one some years ago. They had another copy and, and there was something they wanted to buy, so we, we were able to buy it. So it's over there now. But it's been that way from day one, that it just, it just, you know, there's a wonderful saying that I use probably in everything I've ever written, which is, whatever you're looking for is looking for you too. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of been the motto of the collection. 
you know, I mean. Cormac. Cormac. <laughs> so, I talked to Cormac 20 years ago, or well, when we first started, he said, you know, boy, I'd like to buy your archives or whatever. And he said, well, they were in trunks, I don't know. And anyway, so every six months or a year, I would call him and say, you know, how about your archive? And, uh, and in the beginning, you know, nobody really had heard of Cormac except the literati in New York and, and a handful of scholars. Um, and then one day, the phone rang, and it was a literary dealer in New York, and he said, I've been uh, commissioned to sell Cormac McCarthy's archives. And he said, I have to... He said, there's one other guy I have to talk to, and I have to talk to you. And he said, now I'm going to offer them to every collecting institution in the world. And he said, I have to offer them to you, and I have to offer them to this other guy. And I said, who's the other guy? And he said, well, I can't tell you his name, but he's a billionaire. And I said, uh, well, is it a bidding? Is it going to be putting it up for bids? And he said, no. There's a price, and he gave me the price. And uh, I said, um, I think we can do that. And he said, Well, I'll, he said, I'm going to Argentina, but I'll be back in 10 days, and I'll call you and see. And I said, No, I'll call you in an hour. <laughs> and I called Denise Trout at Texas State, and I said, You know, we have an opportunity to buy these things at this amount of money. And so on, and I said, but we can't pay it out on the dole. We've got to pay it all at once. And, uh, you know, and I said, and, and I don't want to get involved in talking about a sale and then have somebody on the Board of Regents say, who's Cormac McCarthy? <laughs> <laughs> she said, she said, oh, let, me, let me call you back in a few minutes. And she called me back. She said, okay, we can do it. We can pay it. You know, I mean, it was a done deal. In less than an hour, I called him back and said, you know, we can do the deal. But he was not about to sell it that quick because, you know, it would wreck his reputation with his dealers if they didn't get an opportunity to bid on it and so on. So he said, well, and Carmack's the one who, you know, makes the final decision. So, I mean, God, it was six weeks, seven weeks, Sally, whatever it was, of just sweating it out. Yeah, but finally one morning he called and said, okay, you know. <laughs> and so the university sent him a big money order. <laughs> and, uh, but it's over there, Texas State, you know. And he's, if he keeps going, I would think he's going to run the Nobel Prize. Here. Yeah. Just, uh, All right, let's open it up. We usually try and finish up at 7.30, but this has been so interesting, so those of you who need to leave, please do so if you'd like to stay for a few more questions, we'll uh, open it up. Okay, give me a chance to get to you, because it's real. everybody wants to hear what you have to say, and it takes a minute for... I carry, I carry my own microphone, so I don't know. <laughs> and I will just say, I want to mention two words, and that is the integrity of stewardship. I've been involved with Bill and Sally and, and the collections for quite a while, and on these stories of people bidding for these various collections and offering these collections, many people have outbid, but the donors have wanted to give them to the collections because they believe in the integrity of Bill's stewardship. And the, the Whitliffe collections are one of these overnight successes that you've heard about where Bill and Sally and their associates have put in years and years rather than the overnight successes where people think they can throw money at something and all of a sudden get it. Bill has earned this over many, many years. So these artists, filmmakers, musicians, and others are eager to donate their works because of the integrity of the stewardship of the Whitliff Collection. <laughs> I've been checking the independent movie database 
And one of your incidents, how did you get the news that Leon Helm shot himself in the leg practicing quick draw in preparation for the red-headed stranger? Got anything weirder than that? Um, yeah, but I can't tell it. <laughs> No, he, I, I mean, he was going to do it. I called him and said, you know, when can you come down and we can get started? And he said, I just shot myself in the leg. <laughs> I, I can't do it. He would have been great, though. <laughs> You know what Boys Town is? Yeah. It's a, okay. Um, I was working on a script for myself called The Night in Old Mexico. And so I went to New Able Laredo uh, and went to Boys Town just to, you know, and I took my camera, or cameras really. And that was, and, and Boys Town in New Able Laredo was a walled in city. I mean, many, many places of ill repute. Um, many Texas guys, many uh, sheriffs, anyway. <laughs> but what the, always. But, um, so they wouldn't let me photograph with flash, which meant I couldn't get any pictures. Um, but I ran into these guys that go from whorehouse to whorehouse, table to table, and for two bucks, we'll take your picture with your pal, or you know some ladies, and they're not pornographic; they're they're party pictures, you know. But they were doing uh, with great ease what I was trying to do, you know. But they wouldn't let me. Um, so anyway, I started talking to them. They looked at my cameras. I look at theirs. All of their cameras were these old Argus three Cs, which you can not use. So anyway, we got to be <laughs> friends, <laughs> and um, finally they said, "Come on, you know." So I followed them down these little streets and the alleys and so on. We came to this little room that was about the size of a closet, and there was a guy in there with an old Durst and marcher, you know. And the deal was they would cut a piece of film, 35 millimeter film. Excuse me, lay it in the back of the camera, cock the shutter, go take one picture, then run back oh, to the dark room, wow. and they give that negative to this guy. He would run it through some chemicals, wipe it on his pants like that, <laughs> stick it in the enlarger, make one little print, you know, then he would run it through the same chemicals. He would wipe it on his pants. He would take a hair dryer. And he would blow, <laughs> blow it dry, and he would staple it in a little cardboard frame. That was two bucks. And then they would run back, you know, to the car. And, you know, and he would treasure that picture until the sun came up, and then he'd get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Standing there in, the, in their little dark room, that guy was making a print, and I looked behind the enlarger, and there was a little stack of cut negatives, just one, you know, just a pile of them, like that. And I took the top one and, and peeled it off and held it up to the light. So, my God, this is a portrait of a subworld. So I said, How much for these? Oh, no, 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 the federalities would cut our throats. Yeah, but for history, for posterity, you know, and so I said, well, maybe for money. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we made a deal, and I started buying their negatives. They would take their negatives into New Everleda. I had a friend who had a shop there, and they would take the negatives to them. He would give them the money. He would then give the negatives uh, to a lady who worked for him. She could get across the bridge. She would go over to the bus station, put him on the Greyhound bus, and then I'd go to the bus station in Austin. And um, 
And we did this for a year and a month, and then they got scared, uh, and I don't blame them. Uh, they got scared and, and quit doing it. But by that time, I had over 7,000 negatives. And, and most of them were trashed. I mean, I mean, you wipe them on your jeans and you can scar them and tear the emulsion off and everything else. But, uh, boy, the ones that survived, I mean, you know, they, they are a, a portrait of, of a subworld that will make you weep. You know, I mean, they're not, they're not sexy pictures at all. They're human pictures. And uh, anyway, so Sally, when she started law school, um, did legal research to find out if we could get, if we would be sued out of existence if we published those pictures. But as long as we didn't, as I understood it, so, uh, <laughs> as long as we didn't reinterpret the pictures with text, I mean, just let the picture be be the truth of the event. And also, you know, the prostitution wasn't illegal there. And so on. Um, the scary thing was somebody might come shoot you. <laughs> Actually, the funny thing was that the people who were recognizable yeah. Billy Gibbons, for instance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all real proud of being. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what I'm looking at. <laughs> there was a guy, yeah, that, um, who was he was a drunken college boy with two pals. It's the first picture in the book, and um, I got a call from one of them, and uh, he said, "That me." <laughs> and he said. And you see that tall guy? And I said, yeah. I said, he's so-and-so's a uh, famous banker now. And he was in Japan doing some deal. And this kid I was talking to said, you know, I called him and, and said, guess what I'm looking at? <laughs> Meaning of some big business deal. And he said, guess what I'm looking at? I said, what are you looking at? And he said, oh. So, Men sure come through there fast. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, there are some other stories about that. <laughs> Anybody else? I heard today that Sally Hawkins was going to be Sally Hawkins. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mark. At the time, who would you have cast? I know, I can't remember at the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, may, I, may I tell them a story about Freddie Forrest, then? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and, and I have to use a bad word. <laughs> so, so, Freddie Forrest and the director were at odds all the time. I mean, they did not get along. They disliked each other. They were always grouching at each other. So one afternoon, we had one more shot to do. And Tommy Lee and I were standing on the edge of the door, really. And the and cameras are over here and everybody waiting to get the last shot of the day. And way out there, Freddie and the director were just going at each other. And Freddie would get away and shout, point, kick the dirt. I mean, just go in. And Simon, the director, here, kind of pacified us. Yeah, you know, so. And finally, Freddie just took off. I mean, uh, finally, the director just left. And Freddie was still standing out there all by himself. And he would whirl. And he would kick dirt and he would shout and all by himself. And Tommy, and Tommy Lee and I are standing there. And Tommy Lee doesn't say anything, and I'm just watching. <coughs> and finally, Tommy Lee says, You know, Bill, he said, maybe I ought to go talk to him. And I said, Sure, why not? Tommy Lee says, He's an actor. He said, I'm an actor. He said, maybe I'll just talk to him. I said, Tommy Lee, you want to talk to him? Go talk to him. And Tommy Lee said, I think I will. 
<laughs> so Tommy Lee, you know, goes out there. Freddie's just whirling, cursing God, kicking dirt and everything. And then he looks over and he sees Tommy Lee coming. And as Tommy Lee approaches, he takes his hat off, he takes his bandana, and he wipes the sweat man. And that kind of freezes Freddie, and he just watched him. And then Tommy Lee gets right up to him. Now, I can't actually hear what they're saying. They're too far away. But I can kind of read the body language. And uh, so Tommy Lee steps up to him and always, you know, shakes hands with Fred. Fred kind of reluctantly shakes hands. And, uh, and Tommy Lee says, Freddie, he says, and it's 6.30. And he said, look, the sun is going to be down in a minute. We won't have any light. And Freddie just looked at me. And, and Tommy Lee said, you know, we need to get this shot or, or we'll have to do it tomorrow. So what do you say? Let's just, let's stop this nonsense and let's shoot this with him. And Freddie looks at him and then Freddie whirls and kicks up dirt, curses God and so on. And Tommy Lee's very patient. He just stands there and watches. And Freddie's just going bazooka. And finally, Tommy Lee nods and he says, yeah, but Freddie, it's six thirty. The sons, and the crew, you see them over there. All, all everybody's waiting. Get this one shot. It won't take long to get the shot if we just go and sit. So what do you say? Let's let's go and do it, okay? And Freddie looks at me. Oh, he's a, he goes crazy again. And, and so, and Tommy Lee watches. And Tommy, Tommy Lee nods and says, "Okay, Freddie." You know, I understand. Uh, so, puts his hat on, takes his man down, and puts it back in his pocket, shakes him goodbye with Freddie, and he walks back to me, which is way over. And uh, so I stand there, Tommy Lee doesn't say anything. Freddie's out there all by himself, whirling, kicking up dirt, cursing God, the whole routine all over again. And I said, well, Tommy Lee, how'd it go? <laughs> and Tommy Lee said, you know, Bill, said he's crazy as a shit-ass rat. Thank you. 